Are you alive, guys? Still? Surviving? <laughs> um, since uh, there is a step, there is a step for installing the packages, it takes some time. So we will uh, just open the notebook and do this step first. So that then we can come back to it. I will introduce the topic in the meantime, and then you have the packages already installed. Okay. So are you in this page, in the GitHub page? You can go to the resources again, and then the GitHub link. And then you can open Google Colab. And then there is only one file called clustering. So this time it cannot be wrong. This one, no, no bacteria, nothing. Just click it here or here, it will open in another pop up. You can see I just updated a few seconds ago. Um, it's important, as we said, that we create a copy. And you can rename these as you want. Are you all here? Yeah? So in the first step is just to check for the time of the last update. As you can see here on the right is connecting to the runtime. So now it's ready. And this is the time consuming step. So just click on the packages and now we list out the packages. Okay. Yeah. So, I will introduce the topic now and then we come back to this, okay? So um, I would like to introduce uh, some uh, concept related to clustering and uh, heat maps. I know that for many of you it would be trivial, for some others it would be a new thing. Uh, it's a heterogeneous audience, so we have to try to fit <laughs> a lot of things inside. And uh, during this uh, summer school, probably you heard a lot of terms. Many of them can be under this umbrella of uh, machine learning uh, um, world, we can say. We can divide uh, machine learning in two sides. So one supervised um, branch and one unsupervised branch. And the supervised branch basically uses a label uh, to uh, classify. Uh, in this case, socks, <laughs> if you want to classify socks uh, by color or uh, predict a number like the length of the ties, for instance. And the uh, part that we are talking about today, actually, Madeleine already mentioned it a bit, uh, is dimensionality reduction. Permanova uh, PicoA is one of those, PCA is one of those, and uh, many others that you heard before, Disney, UMAP. And uh, there are uh, methods based on association. So how frequent you can find an object together with another one. And you can um, also find the clustering branch here. That is the one that I'm talking about today. So we want to uh, put, for instance, similar clothing together. Um, the supervised learning, the labels are provided, as I said, you have your data and you divide your uh, data in training and testing. Uh, you build a model, machine learning model, based on the training. Here we have a lot of uh, type of fruits. Um, and then we build whatever machine learning we want. And then uh, we build a predicting model on this. The test set uh, is never seen by the model and is used to evaluate the performance of your model. This is a very uh, uh, generalization, of course. There are many more complicated ways of doing this. These are just uh, some examples, like random forest probably is the most common used in metabolomics, I think, uh, together with some others. Renal regression, logistic regression, uh, boosting models, and so on. But today, I want to focus a lot on unsupervised learning. So no labels are provided. In this case, uh, we have uh, a bunch of uh, animals, and we want to build a model that will group together 
objects, observations that are very similar to each other. So here we have the our original cluster data and here we have cluster data. So um, many observations close uh, to each other would be very similar in the, in, in the grouping. And uh, the only uh, clustering approach I'm talking about today is hierarchical structure uh, clustering, where uh, basically the goal is to estimate the relation between every sample or feature um, in a data set. And it can be visualized in very uh, in this very nice way with the dendrogram that you probably saw many, many times before, where the uh, height here uh, indicates the cluster distance. So from the bottom up, you have uh, more similar objects until the, the top. And for instance, here we can split cats and dogs uh, and the size uh, and so on. Um, there are many ways uh, of doing it. Um, the most popular is called agglomerative hierarchical clustering, where you have an iterative process, where at the beginning, every observation is a cluster. You, so every sample, let's say, is a cluster. And then in our iterative process, step by step, we merge the, the clusters close to each other uh, according to the similarities until this process stops when uh, you have one large cluster. And now we merge the clusters uh, using this linkage method. So you can do it in uh, four different ways. You can calculate the distance between two clusters that is minimum or the maximum distance or the average or the centroid uh, distance. So in this case, let's say the centroid is the center of the cluster. Um, what we are interested in is to find uh, uh, clusters, right? And uh, a priori, we don't have a uh, defined number of clusters when we have a dendrogram uh, after hierarchical clustering. So we want to cut the branches of this tree at uh, a certain uh, height where um, it's for us meaningful. And this is uh, quite uh, challenging because um, it can be quite dependent on your field, the samples that you have, the visual inspection that you do in your data, but can also be computationally calculated. And I will um, uh, show you in a moment. So here, this uh, dash uh, uh, line indicates where I cut the tree and all the uh, branches uh, uh, below are the clusters that we form. There are different ways of cutting the, the trees. One of the simplest method is called the uh, elbow method, uh, where the within clusters, uh, sum of distances is calculated every time a cluster is merged together. And you can plot this and where you observe uh, in this layer curve a band, a knee, some people call it, or an elbow, is the proper amount of clusters. There are pros and cons of hierarchical clustering. Uh, the pros is that it doesn't need the defined cluster. You can just plot the dendrogram and uh, inspect the data. Um, but uh, can also be uh, very challenging to define a cut in the dendrogram if you are interested in uh, defining the number of clusters. Probably you are also very used to HitMap uh, concept. Uh, HitMap is just a visual a visualization of your data. You have samples here in the X and features in the, in the columns. And the um, color is just the intensity of your values. In our case, the intensity is uh, of the metabolite. Here you can see an heat map before doing hierarchical clustering. So there is no order here. And here on the right, you can see after hierarchical clustering. As you can see, the rows and the columns are reordered according to the most similar objects or observations. And we can define uh, the number of clusters in the heat map itself uh, by cutting the tree as I showed before. And here you can see three main clusters according to the samples and three main clusters according to the, to the features. Okay, so let's come back to the notebook. Let me know if there is anything unclear, of course. Yeah. <laughs> My strategy didn't work. <laughs> I hope that coming back here, you could have fixed it. Maybe 
So the, the clustering, you built a <coughs> dendro graph first and then plot it for basically. Uh, yeah. Center. But um, at least in phylogenetics, there are many, many different ways to build those dendro graphs. Yeah. And sometimes they're quite different results. That must be the case with yeah. this stuff as well. Yes. So even when uh, we run the code, actually every time is uh, there is some sort of stochasticity. So every time you generate, it could be different according to the complexity of the data set. So that's why we fix usually uh, a specific point in the in the code that we will show, and that you say I want reproducible results. So every time you will generate, it will be the same result. But there are different ways of cutting the tree. It's true. In uh, phylogeny, you use uh, PGA or something like that. I think something I don't remember. Yeah, some different ways. And the uh, arachnoid clustering is just one of the most basic way of doing clustering. There are many others like k-means or density clustering and so on that are more advanced. But it's the easiest to explain, I think, uh, from the pedagogical point of view, because as a visual representation of your samples. And it can become very uh, difficult to interpret when you have uh, 2,000, 3,000 samples, of course. Or if you plot the features, then it would be 5,000 uh, features. And every line in the tree is a, a feature. Um, in the end, the question is, is it meaningful clustering? Yeah, to do that, and there are some comments here, you have to check for the stability of the clusters. So there are methods that shuffle around the labels, for instance, of the samples and verify if your clustering was robust or not. In that case, you can uh, refuse the clusters or not. Yeah. And we need an elevator song here. <laughs> yeah, it could be. Yeah. Ah, uh, yours done? Yeah. Depends on the net. <laughs> of course, you can go for coffee or whatever, right? <laughs> instead of inside. Yeah. Now we will upload our files. Yeah. Uh, yeah, my is it's done, but I don't know the others. So it's the same files so of uh, the entire day, <laughs> basically. So so the feature table, the imputed quant table, and the metadata. Okay. The imputed quantification table. It's the exact same input. Yeah, the same input as a big way. Are you all in? Okay, we wait. Did you install the libraries? It's still uh, on the Libraries are done, nice.
Does it work? Yeah? Yeah? Install all of you? Yeah? So I'm moving on, okay? So first we load the libraries. This time should be fast. <laughs> and then here you can just uh, copy and paste the path of your files as before, if you remember. You can just do like that and uh, copy the path. Yeah? And then you can put it here. One for the feature table and one for the metadata file. Then we will read the data and we'll check the dimension of our files. We can visualize, as you know already, the first six lines of our feature table and the first six lines of the metadata. Did you manage to read the files? Yeah. No issues, okay. Good, wow, that's the first time. <laughs> this is just to check uh, what's our, what are the attributes of our uh, metadata, the attribute sample. As you can see, we have one uh, uh, verbal blank still. And this is to check how many of the uh, samples in the metadata are in the feature table. As you can see, one is not and is the uh, paper blank. So we are gonna check this. And you can see the paper blank here. We want to remove this from the metadata. And we check uh, the dimension again. So you should have 12 samples, right? And three columns. We transpose the feature table because we want the um, features in the columns in our analysis. And we check again, yeah? You check again the dimension if you want. And it should, have, uh, should be like 12 samples and a specific amount of features. We check if the rows are in the same order. At the beginning, they are not, but we transform them to be in the same order. We scale the data. All these steps are the same on the Pico A if you have a deja vu. <laughs> and then we check again. So here it starts the actual clustering. I reported here again the steps, but you, we don't need to go through that again. Um, there are different uh, ways of doing it. There are different distance matrices, as uh, Madeleine already mentioned. Here we will go with Euclidean, but you can change it with Canberra. You can play around with it. And I reported also where you can find all the distances that you can put. So we calculate uh, first the distance, the pairwise distance between all the um, uh, samples, the features and samples. And here we calculate the hierarchical classing. As I mentioned uh, to you before, here we set this seed that is just a way to reproduce the analysis always in the same way. If you don't put this, then um, result can change because it's stochastic. And this is just a one of the method that I mentioned, the linkage method. It can be complete, it can be average, it can be central. So if you would boost, if you want to do like a Similar to bootstrapping, yeah. you would uh, do 100 yes. with different Yes, exactly. exactly, yeah. And shuffling the labels as well. Yeah. So yeah. then we plot. And I'm curious to see if you get something similar or something completely out of the blue. <laughs> so what I get is that uh, the samples uh, 45M cluster in a way together in this split. I don't know if you get something similar. And then there is a second split here, major split. And, um, and in this major split, we have some two subclusters, we can call them, uh, the 15 here, 
and the M and the five M. You got something similar? Good, reproducible, we can publish. <laughs> Next, uh, it seems here that there are two main uh, groups, but uh, it seems there are other two subclusters. So we want to cut the tree. And in this case, this parameter indicates how many splits we want. So in this case, I say three. And we can check the result, which samples belong to which cluster. Is it clear? And you can check uh, how many uh, samples are in each cluster. Then we can also highlight uh, with the colorful rectangles the clusters, if you want to use it for publication of anything else, as you can see here. And you can also color the branches if you like. As I said, uh, it can be tricky to define the number of clusters. Now I say three, but uh, we don't really know very well at the moment. Therefore, we will uh, proceed with this elbow method that I mentioned in the presentation. Let's uh, run this. And we can see this band, this knee here, or elbow at three. So it could be that there are three clusters. But the elbow method is a bit sometimes ambiguous. It can be two or it can be three. Therefore, we will perform another analysis, so it's called silhouette method, and we will check how many clusters suggest us. In this case, it says two because there are two main splits actually. Do you get something similar? Yeah. Another thing that uh, it could be uh, altering your uh, uh, analysis in the clustering if you get something completely different is the input data. Sometimes metabolomics data are very noisy. We impute a lot and we create this zero variance problem. So imagine zero, 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 and one feature that has a value. So let's see what happens if we remove those features. Okay, sorry, can you go up? Yes. Different. It's different. How many clusters uh, suggest this? Uh, one, two, three. three clusters. And the elbow method as well? Yeah. Oh, that's nice. Oh, they agree. Uh, <laughs> What if your question suggestion is clearly, you're yeah, pretty clear. clearly wrong? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. Clearly wrong sounds a little weird, but uh, the, the PCA gave the clustering as I would expect. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Because the interpretation from the uh, hierarchical clustering it's uh, not 100% what you expect as a cluster. It's more a visual interpretation of the relation, hierarchical relationship of the groups. So I will, I will use more advanced methods like k-means or density clustering to discover more meaningful clusters. But also, as I, I wanted to mention here, sometimes it could be because you have this zero variance problem. And then when you cluster, you obtain things that are unexpected. So I wanted to show you what happens if we remove those. In this case, I use, uh, I don't want features that have uh, a zero median absolute deviation. Let's say variance, you can change this as bar, it's the same. Remove this. And we check the dimension. In my case, I don't remove the many features, but I heard that some people have 50,000 features. <laughs> so maybe you will reduce a lot your dimensionality, it happens to you? Do you remove a lot of very few features? Very few, okay. So if we generate again, the clustering for me doesn't change. So I can conclude from here that uh, the, the samples here, uh, M and the 5M actually are quite close and they make sense because in the dilution process, they are also close in time. Um, so we excluded that this clustering is biased by the fact that there are many noisy features. Finally, we want to generate the heat maps. We check again uh, the uh, attributes that we have. And we prepare here our uh, input data for the heat map. And then we plot.
You get something like that? Something very different or something very similar? Somewhat different? Which difference do you see in yours? Okay. Yeah, this one could be just uh, when you plot, but uh, you can check how the hierarchical clustering is uh, to see if it makes sense. Because it could be, because also again, it starts from a random point. And uh, as I said, we can uh, uh, perform uh, a clustering to break in pieces, in blocks, these groups. We can cut the, these trees to obtain clusters. And you obtain uh, this nice visualization where you have a clear cut of the, of the groups. As you can see. But I want to underline that this is uh, what I observe in my data set, but you can play around, of course, with the parameters and say, I don't want three, I want four, uh, or my elbows or silhouette approach suggests four clusters or three clusters, of course. Yes. Can you use this where to change the number of clusters? Yes. In, in this last part or before? In this last part, you can change it here for the rows. And this is for the columns. And uh, here, this is a way uh, to extract the features that belong to a specific cluster, because I think you can use it in the future. If you want to combine uh, your results from GMPS or Sirius or uh, any other um, um, annotation system. So I want to check how many, again, how many features I have in each cluster. And then uh, I just extract them from this object. What you should be able to see at the end of doing this is a table with the features and the cluster assignment. Is working? Nice. And then you can write the file. And that's it. Basically, you can save the PDF and uh, go maybe in Illustrator and modify it or whatever you want. And it is, it's important that you download these files because they will disappear once you close. So remember to download the, the feature clusters and the uh, ITMA. It's working. You can open it and see how is the result. It's one of the things. Someone else has problems? Just yeah. So if you want to publish a paper where you are used to this, like would you then scare or like the question is about uh details, would you then scare the another the book or the with, uh, I will share or? I will share everything. So from the another book to the PDF files if you want to include them in the paper. Yeah. Otherwise just the another book that you generated, you will remember all the plots and all the other commands that you've done. I usually will share it as an other book or it's nice also as a HTML file or PDF. So then people can just open it without need of knowing Google Colab or Anaconda or anything else. You can download it as a HTML file. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Any journals that require that Nowadays, journals require to release the code in most of the journals. So you really need to think about how reproducible are your results, I guess. And I will share also my content environment if I was working in my computer so that people can install my environment as well. So it's exactly the same. Actually, at the end of this uh, notebook, 
you can see here that I'm uh, saying I want to see all the versions and all the, the stuff that I'm running. So here you can see I run uh, in Ubuntu because Google has Ubuntu and there's uh, our version 421 and all the versions of the packages. And in the paper, you have to refer to all the versions that you have run because many times you get different results. R is an open source uh, software that is uh, given without guarantee that it works. <laughs> so. Oh, okay, where? I have an error because of my input. Ah, okay. Okay. Yeah, of course. You work for you guys? Yeah? yeah? Nice. Well, it works, but uh, yeah. I'm not happy with my posture. I know. Really? <laughs> Can I see it? 